Welcome back to the Agentic Schools Manifesto. This is Chapter 7, Salvaging Standardization from the Educational Junkyard. While there is legitimate concern about the ways in which academics have been standardized in schools, there are also important benefits that follow from achieving standardization. Consider the possibility that standardized education is not the bogeyman it is often made out to be. Consider the possibility that this is a baby and bathwater type of situation, and we need to be careful to throw out the wastewater, not our most beloved. Let's reconsider the potential for standardized education using a one-size-fits-all approach to schooling children. I want to be clear that there is a fundamental problem with using standardized academic tests for high-stakes accountability for teachers and or schools within state bureaucracies. That fundamental problem is with the disconnect between the deeper learning that is required in today's society and the measures being used to hold teachers and schools accountable. Neither standardized academic testing nor bureaucratic accountability for test results would be good on their own, and the combination is worse. Those means of managing the school system suck at educating children. The fundamental purpose of schools is to educate children, right? Recall that education is about ensuring that people have a productive relationship to reality. An educated person is someone who perceives accurately, thinks clearly, and acts effectively on self-selected goals and aspirations that are appropriate to their situation as they non-consciously maintain their mental maps of reality and how it works. Academic knowledge is a useful tool for relating to reality, but it is one of many tools we have available, and it is not quite as important as it is usually made out to be. Academic tests, especially when they have been standardized and are being used for high-stakes bureaucratic decision-making, do not have any meaningful relationship to the possibility that the test taker is educated in this sense. Standardized academic courses delivered by bureaucratic schools do not succeed in educating children most of the time, as indicated by the epidemic of disengagement. But does that automatically mean that standardized education can't work in any form? As we eliminate the toxic bathwater of industrial bureaucratic factory model schooling, we need to make sure that we do not throw out the baby of children and their teachers with it. Lamenting the effects of standardized education on children who have been subjected to industrialized factory model schools is a trope of many education critics on both sides of the political aisle. They complain that one size does not fit all. Therefore, standardizing education in our school system is really bad. But are they correct that standardization in itself is bad? Or is it possible that if we standardize something other than academics, we could get better results from the school system? Though many people don't seem to realize it, we can make useful assessments that do have a meaningful relationship to education in the sense I mean it. The key assessments are for motivation and engagement. Turns out that when a student's motivations are autonomous and engagement is agentic, then that student participates more successfully in whatever activities they have available academic or otherwise. In fact, any experience is educative when motivations are autonomous and engagement is agentic. The scientific community that has been most thoroughly examining motivation and engagement since the 1970s calls their framework self determination theory, SDT. They did not set out to study learning per se, but it turned out that they gained some crucial insights. One of their most central insights is that we humans all have primary psychological needs that were not previously recognized for the role that they play in motivation, engagement, and most important for our purpose right now, learning. You are familiar with your needs for air, water, food, and shelter. Those four needs are physiological because if you don't get them satisfied, then you die. 
One psychological need is familiar, the need for sleep. It is psychological because thwarting it causes psychological distresses like anxiety and depression. But there's no credible evidence that the lack of sleep in itself can kill you. But before I talk about our other three psychological needs, I want to circle back to our need for air. There are some nuances in reference to that need that will help us appreciate how our psychological needs contribute to the effectiveness of schools and open up the possibility for an effective one-size-fits-all standardized education. Let's imagine you want to see a spectacular shipwreck and the fish that now live in it. The wreck is about 30 feet underwater, and a brief glimpse is not enough. Do you just hold your breath and go for it? The standard medical line on brains deprived of oxygen is that brain damage can start within five minutes and brain death after 10. Since you don't feel like killing yourself and you want to avoid brain damage, Taking along a tank of compressed air seems like a good idea. The next question is, after Amazon delivers it, how much oxygen should you put in the tank? If the tank is all oxygen, you should be able to stay down for the longest possible time, right? Wrong. Too much oxygen is poisonous. Based on a quick Google search, you find that the regular air we normally breathe it's about 80% neutral gases, mostly nitrogen with a smattering of argon water vapor and other stuff. So you guesstimate the ratio and throw it together, figuring that as long as you test it out beforehand, your suffocation response would alert you if you have too little oxygen in the mix. Oxygen is such a central survival imperative that nature surely created our suffocation alarm system to detect a lack of oxygen, right? Wrong again. Instead, she provides us with an alarm that detects when there is too much carbon dioxide in our air. She has attuned us to the waste product of our breathing process. We know this because of tragic accidents at fruit warehouses, where the oxygen is removed to keep the fruit fresh while it awaits delivery to the market. Workers have occasionally entered the room, not realizing that there was no oxygen in it. The security footage shows that instead of gasping and becoming alarmed, they appear completely calm as they get sleepy, lie down on the floor, and die. Human suffocation responses are wired to detect too much carbon dioxide, not the lack of oxygen. Making these kinds of mistakes is why my little scenario of DIY gas blending with the help of Google and Amazon is a terrible idea. And it turns out that there is a one-size-fits-all recipe for breathable air that is a combination of both active and neutral ingredients. Healthy air consists of less than 1% of the active ingredient carbon dioxide, 19 to 23% of the active ingredient oxygen, and 76 to 80% of the neutral gases such as nitrogen, argon, water vapor, etc. Now, that we understand the one-size-fits-all recipe for breathable air, I want to turn our attention to schooling. We start with two key constraints. The first constraint is that all or nothing doesn't make sense. Not a thing. We may like the idea of zero carbon dioxide in our air, but we produce that gas with every exhalation, so zero is not a reasonable goal. The second constraint is that we need to understand the difference between active ingredients and neutral ingredients. Oxygen and carbon dioxide are both active ingredients. They matter the most, even though by proportion, they appear to be minor components. Water vapor, nitrogen, argon, etc. are all neutral. They don't matter as much, except that they are a majority of the air we breathe. The question we have to ask is, what are the active ingredients in school? Most people's intuition scream out academics, but that intuition is wrong. The active nutritive ingredients are those four primary psychological needs for sleep, relatedness, autonomy, and competence. For now, the three active needs ingredients that many people may not be familiar with, relatedness, autonomy, and competence, are lumped together into the term agency. This works 
because when all three of those primary psychological needs are satisfied, then motivations are autonomous. And when motivations are autonomous, then engagement is more likely to be agentic, not merely behavioral. My claim is that agentic engagement is the most important ingredient in deeper learning, and therefore the most important ingredient in schooling. So, I'm saying that in the analogy to gas blending, agentic engagement, or just agency, is the active ingredient, the equivalent of oxygen. I will also note that in addition to the primary psychological needs which apply to all humans, there are also needs that are unique to an individual situation or culture, and they are also included under the term agency. The toxic equivalent to carbon dioxide in this analogy is the demands from others that tend to thwart the primary psychological needs. There are societal demands, organizational demands, and more directly, there are demands from authority figures who may have been appointed arbitrarily to work with the students in that particular school or classroom. I will remind you that all or nothing are not even plausible possibilities. So what I am talking about is having those demands from authority figures, their organization and society, not exceed some threshold point that transforms them from being merely a proportionally tiny factor in the overall system into being an urgent toxic hazard that could damage the learning process. I am going to designate all of these demands as imposed authority. I'm qualifying the term authority with the adjective imposed because I want to be clear that authority per se is not the toxin. One of the things that SDT has revealed is that when a child has a particularly good relationship to an authority figure, it is possible that the child can feel almost as autonomous about a choice made by that authority figure as if the child had made that choice themselves. This means that champions of a no-nonsense-in-the-classroom, teacher-centric approach are correct to assume that under the right conditions, my way or the highway is a perfectly reasonable demand by a trusted instructor. Notice I said trusted. On the other hand, those who champion a learner-centric approach to operating K-12 schools, when they are criticizing schools in which children had no say in the classes they are made to attend, also have an important and valid point. There are negative motivational and learning consequences to being forced to attend lessons without meaningful recourse to resolving the inherent conflict that arises from that imposition. When the instructor is not a trusted authority, then there is potential for their demands to be psychologically and educationally toxic. So, I am clear, some degree of imposed authority is inescapably necessary. And I'm also clear that too much imposed authority creates inescapably negative learning consequences. The final ingredient that we need is the combination of neutral elements that do not matter as much, but are still present and make up a major component in the overall system. In particular, I will note that academics in the forms of science, technology, engineering, arts, mathematics, etc. are all neutral tools that can help folks understand and more productively engage with reality. Despite rhetorical flourishes, to the contrary, they are not, in and of themselves, the be-all and end-all of education. They are important ingredients, but they are not the active ingredients. Using this analogy, then, it is clear that most schools tend to have too much of the toxin of imposed authority and too little of the active ingredients that make up agency. Plus, the neutral ingredients of academic tools are treated as if they are an active ingredient, which is a mistake. I have laid out this analogy in a table on page 46. Food is included. Food provides additional insight because of the role that parents can play in providing support for each need. It is common for parents to send some food from home rather than rely on school to be the sole supplier of support for that need. Some schools provide food for students, though even when that is the case, some parents are not impressed with the quality of that food so they provide some from home. On the other hand, it would be absurd 
for parents not to trust a school with providing air. In order to wrap our minds around this part of the analogy, I want to be clear about some details. It does not normally occur to parents that air could be a concern, because we all assume that clean, unpolluted air is a pervasive fact of life. It is available everywhere all the time, isn't it? As someone who grew up in Los Angeles, California in the 1970s, an activist who was recently working on fighting industrial air pollution in Portland, Oregon, and even more recently, having traveled to Kathmandu, Nepal, and Santiago, Chile, I can tell you with confidence that clean, unpolluted air is not always pervasively available. But in places where pollution has compromised the air, it is also not the case that parents attempt to provide better quality air for their children while they are at school. In order to effectively address that particular concern, they would need to outfit their child with a self-contained breathing apparatus like those that are used by firefighters or scuba divers. The logistics of doing that on an individual basis are so absurd that it is unheard of. On the other hand, one project we did in Portland involved installing air filters inside the buildings at one school dangerously near a major interstate highway in order to monitor how much the indoor air quality improved. The district has since committed to relocating that school because the air quality was so bad. As far as I'm aware, no one ever suggested solving that problem on an individual basis, and the district decided that fulfilling their responsibility of providing clean, unpolluted air to their students and staff was best served by relocating the entire school. The need for air is different from the need for food, in two important ways for this analogy. First, there is the time scale of how the need is satisfied. We can eat with large gaps of time between instances of ingestion. It is perfectly plausible for someone to fast for multiple days without causing themselves any damage. However, we need to breathe almost constantly, given the standard medical fact that I mentioned before, in which brain damage can be caused within a few minutes. This difference means that the provision of support for the need implies very different logistical challenges. The other important difference is in the availability of the satisfiers of the need. Air is pervasively available, while food can often be scarce. The question is whether our psychological needs and provisions for their satisfaction are more like air or more like food. In the case of the psychological need for sleep, it is usually supported only at home, except in the case of kindergartners. Provisions to support the need for sleep are not too much of a burden, which is why it is easily supported by kindergartens. It is more like food than air. The other three psychological needs are more like air in both time scale and provision of satisfiers. It is not even plausible for parents to supply support from home. There is not even an equivalent to scuba for agency. Correcting the systematic cultural mistakes embedded in our school system is going to mean that we have to pull on the levers of change. We need to create a healthier blend of agency, authority, and the tools we use to engage productively with reality. I can help. First, few schools collect the right data to be sure that they can effectively manage their classroom and school climates. To address that problem, I created the Instant Climate Formative Assessment Tool. The tool is designed to be used directly by a teacher or principal to assess how well the folks they are responsible for supporting are having their needs satisfied, how well support is being provided, what their patterns of motivation are, and how deeply engaged they are. Ideally, the school would also be using a commercially available climate measure at least once or twice per year to summatively validate what the teachers and principals are observing using the instant climate measure. Second, most school boards and other policy makers do not understand the role that primary psychological needs play in deeper learning. So I created the deeper learning resolution to embed the psychology of learning in policy so the policy stops undermining learning. I encourage you to visit each of the websites for those tools in order to learn more. The URL and QR codes for dladvocates.org are on page 48, while you can find the URL and QR codes for the Instant Climate Tool on page 83. 
Our challenge is to ensure we have the tools we need to monitor and manage the proportions of agency and imposed authority in schools. For mainstream schools, it is mostly about increasing agency and decreasing imposed authority. I challenge holistic school folks to participate in collecting the kind of data that can prove their superiority in terms of need satisfaction, motivation, and engagement. Doing so will also have the added advantage of helping them manage the culture and climate of their schools with more precision. This concludes the seventh episode of the Agentic Schools Manifesto. If you would like to gain access to the illustrations, the footnotes, the appendices, and the bibliography, the PDF and illustrated video versions of the book are available as membership benefits when you join Deeper Learning Advocates for $5 per month or more at dladvocates.org forward slash donate. If you would like more information about the catalytic pedagogy philosophy, how self-determination theory applies in education, and what it will take to transform education systems around the world globe, check out my other website, holisticequity.org. There, under the Tools tab, you will find a variety of valuable ways to either deepen your understanding or apply that understanding in your school. Thank you for your kind attention.